I appreciate everybody uh, waiting as we got our live transcription um, set to go. And we're gonna kick right off. Uh, we are recording this event. Uh, so for those of you who wanna share this with your colleagues at your campuses or uh, at other campuses, please feel free to. You'll get a recording of the link after the session has ended. Um, I wanna welcome you all to today's webinar. My name is Mike Daly. I'm the Director of Operations for SUNY OER Services. Um, next slide, please. Um, and what we're really going to focus in on today is Lumen Circles, which is brought to us in a coordinated partnership through Lumen Learning, uh, SUNY's OER partner and a professional development partner now as well. Uh, SUNY OER Services, which is a shared service operating out of SUNY's Office of Library and Information Services, working with SUNY campuses, faculty and students to re really raise the awareness of the effective practices um, around open educational resources or OER, but really more broadly about uh, the innovative ways that faculty can seek out, can seek to change their pedagogy, uh, their teaching styles, and their interactions with students. And we do so in conjunction with my colleague at the Center for Professional Development, uh, Chris Price, who is with us today and you know, co-facilitating this panel. You'll hear this throughout the event, but I do want to lead off with it and make sure that everybody is aware that Lumen Circles is offered at no cost to SUNY faculty. Um, for the upcoming academic year, which includes summer 21, fall 21, and spring 2022. Our panelists today, who you'll see a little bit more of and hear more of directly, um, represent much of what I saw in the chat when you were all introducing yourselves, which is really a diversity of representation from the campuses they work on, whether large um, community colleges, research centers such as the University of Albany, Mohawk Valley Community College, and even um, the roles they play at their campuses. So you'll hear from an adjunct professor, Adrian Carr at SUNY Plattsburgh, um, Jesus at Albany, who is a librarian and also teaches as a faculty member, Nicole Simon, who wears a couple different hats. So really uh, a broad uh, spectrum of participants who are willing to share their experience with Lumen Circles. Um, and we hope that you'll be asking questions throughout the event. Next slide. So I mentioned this uh, a little bit Prior to this, um, but as a reminder, Lumen Circle is supported by SUNY Center for Professional Development and SUNY OER Services. There are no cost to SUNY faculty um, to, to participate. The eligibility is any SUNY faculty teaching at least one class. If you're on the edge, whether you're eligible or not, please fill out the, uh, the interest form um, and indicate what questions you have, whether or not you're eligible. Um, myself and Chris Price and, and Julie, um, from Lumen Learning are more than willing to have uh, deeper conversations about the role you might play in participating in Lumen Circles. And you can apply and find more information at info.lumenlearning.com forward slash circles SUNY. And we'll be sharing out that URL in the chat as well. Next slide. So we'll turn it over to Chris Price now. Chris, as I mentioned, is the Academic Programs Manager for SUNY Center for Professional Development. And he's really gonna talk about the pedagogy that drives uh, Lumen Circles and the fellowships. Chris? Yeah, so Lumen Circles are, um, I think, a, a good model for professional development for faculty because they are able to combine what we know about good teaching with what you're actually doing in your classroom. And so, um, you know, you probably have heard or uh, gone to sessions or workshops where you were told, you know, what the research says about and the evidence says uh, is good teaching. Um, and, you know, those are good to go to. That's good to you know, learn about that. But, um, you know, it's better if you're able to apply what we know uh, about good teaching and what the evidence is about good teaching as you're actually teaching uh, and applying that evidence to your own uh, practice in the classroom or online or whatever, whatever modality you teach. And so Lumen Circles brings together the evidence from the literature with evidence in your classroom as you're teaching, uh, combines that into an evidence-based teaching practice and uh, a reflective practice that you can, um, so that you can improve your teaching based on what you're actually doing in the classroom and based what we know about good teaching. Next slide, please. So uh, John, we want you to launch the poll, I suppose now. Uh, polling is launched. So yeah, we'd like to know what your role is. Uh, you should all be able to see the poll. If you can't see it, let us know. Thank you. 
So we have 43 here, John. So I guess whenever you get close to that number, we should end it. Uh, yes, please. They're starting to come in now. Okay. They're streaming in now. Five, six, seven. I think we need to give it a little, little more time. There's a little few more results coming in. We want to capture as many as possible. Uh, Julie pointed out that only attendees can vote. So 32 is our limit. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, we have 21 of, of 32 and the progression has stopped. I think we have holdouts. OK. <laughs> Well, we probably have a critical mass. We could probably. I think we have a we have a sample. We have an okay. accurate. I think we have this time we have an accurate sample. So I will end poll and I will share results. Okay, so we have mostly faculty here, uh, which is good. Uh, uh, we welcome everyone else here, of course. Um, however, you know you'll hear uh, and you might have saw in the uh, emails, the many emails you received from me, maybe over the last few weeks about Lumen Circles that the way they work is when you're actually actively teaching a course, you'll be reflecting upon things that you're doing as you teach. So, um, so we, we recommend that only those who are actually actively teaching a course participate. Uh, and so we have mostly faculty here, I see. Can I scroll down? I can scroll down, great. So how familiar with this teaching practice community built? So, uh, 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 yep, just wanna say something? Oh, I thought I heard something. So, the ne next few questions talk about evidence-based teaching practices that Lumen is built on. Um, and so, you know, no matter how familiar you are with each of the practices from this poll, uh, and that's another thing I like about Lumen Circles is that it allows for different entry points. So even if you're new and you're very unfamiliar with any of these practices, uh, you'll get something out of it. But even if you use these practices frequently, what participation in a circle allows you to do is kind of, um, you know, maybe try out different practices or improve upon the ones you're doing well or recognize, well, maybe this is one I want to try out a little bit that I don't know as well or that I haven't used as much in my class. So community building um, looks like most of you are using that sometimes. It just keeps scrolling down here. Formative feedback, okay. You all know that you should, uh, for the most part, give students constructive, ungraded feedback as you go along, very good. Adaptability, sometimes a little similar to, to community building and, and time on task, all right. Great. So looks like many of you have a lot of kind of knowledge, at least of, of evidence-based teaching practices. So that's good. But like I said, uh, you know, you can certainly build on that knowledge in, as you participate in a circle. So next slide, please. So Julie, I believe I was going to talk about this slide too, or is this your slide? Sure, go ahead and you've been through the program, so yeah. go ahead. Right, as Julie mentioned, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I did go through a circle. So I'm familiar with these and, and when you will become very familiar with these uh, four areas and then the uh, areas below them, the sub areas for each as you go through them in circles. So um, all of these evidence-based teaching frameworks are uh, uh, came from the book that's referenced there on the slide, Gail Mello's book, Taking College Teaching Seriously, Pedagogy Matters. And essentially what they did is they enrolled faculty at LaGuardia Community College. I'm not sure if other colleges were involved, but it was based in LaGuardia Community College uh, in teaching circles. And they actually did research around what constitutes uh, evidence-based teaching practice. And so from that research came these this framework, which is really at the heart of what Lumen Circles are all about. Uh, and um, so good teaching, good evidence-based teaching is supportive, uh, challenging, varied, and organized. And it tells you below that kind of what that means. Uh, and I won't go through all of them, but uh, I don't want to steal any Julius Thunder, but as you go through your uh, as you go through your participation in a circle, you're going to be utilizing the uh, bulleted tags, they call them in the circle, to um, in your reflections about 
your teaching uh, in your weekly posts. And, and you'll be able to see kind of wh where you're teaching clusters, the things that you're focusing on your teaching. Uh, and so you'll also be obviously then be able to see things that maybe you're not focusing on here. So that's how the evidence-based teaching practices are built into the model. Um, you don't have to read uh, the teaching, Taking College Seriously teaching book, but it's a short book and I, I recommend it highly if I check it out. Uh, but all the evidence-based teaching uh, literature is kind of baked into the process. Next slide. And so I think this would be my last slide here. And, and, and I, you know, we, as you saw from the poll results, many of you are using these practices already. Um, and so, uh, and so that's, that's good, but doesn't mean that uh, we, you know, one of the things I, you learn early on as, as a teacher is that you could always improve no matter how many years you've been teaching, uh, even if you're new or, or you have 20 years in your belt, you could always improve how you're uh, implementing teaching practices. So uh, if you're using them already, that's great. Uh, if you're not, like I said earlier, you'll learn how to use them. Uh, but a lot of times faculty don't necessarily know, uh, can't name them. Uh, and so what this process does is kind of help you uh, put words to what you're already doing, help you, help you talk about it with others, help you think about it, help you reflect upon it. Uh, and therefore, increasing your own preparedness and confidence in the process of teaching, um, kind of tapping into your the expertise that you already have, uh, and again, helping you better communicate about that and reflect on it. And then as you do that, the ultimate goal here is that you, your students will be more successful because you'll be more, um, you'll be more uh, intentional about how you're using evidence-based teaching practices. Next slide. Okay. So now we're turning to our panel. Yeah, so I'll take it over from here, Chris. Thanks. I'm going to ask our panelists uh, listed in a vertical structure here, not ranked in any sp specific order, but I'll start at the top. And Nicole Simon, if you just want to introduce yourself and then answer uh, briefly the question, you know, why did you seek out to explore evidence-based teaching practices? Hi, Nicole Simon from Nassau Community College. I'm the Engineering Physics Technology Department. Um, I've been doing human circles for ooh, about a year and a half, and I now facilitate for them. Um, it's just a wonderful experience. And why you want to look at evidence-based teaching practices, it really helps you explore how you teach, why you teach, and just taking your teaching to the next level. Being able to put theory to practice, being able to take a look at what it is you've already been doing and how you can enhance that for your students. Thanks, Nicole. And Jesus at the University of Albany, turn it over to you. Yes, I am. Um... Uh, both a study librarian and associate faculty, and I actually applied a Lumen Circle with uh, another professor. So we were co-teaching together a research methods course. Uh, why do I, uh, why explore evidence-based teaching practices? I think they're, they're have, they have demonstrated that uh, improve student outcomes, uh, and uh, they have helped me focus on planning my, ses my sessions and reflecting on, on in a way that I have never done before. Like for example, like there is one evidence that is scaffolding. Another one is higher order thinking. Another one is self-reflection. And uh, this uh, circle allow me to connect these different ev 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 evidence uh, practices together before I maybe thought about them uh, separately. And now when you actually mix them together and make the connection, I think that makes a bigger impact in your teaching and also uh, in terms of student outcomes. Thank you, Jesus. And we'll move geographically west on the map and turn it over to Michelle at Mohawk Valley Community College. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Speech, and I'm an educator in here up in central New York. Um, my primary reason was to get back to the heart of education and really start finding best practices to support the teaching and learning foundation and help increase those student learning outcomes, especially during a time as we had transitioned to the online environment due to the pandemic. Um, so I really think that the implementations of the evidence-based uh, practices fit into that model of that student-centered learning and teaching style. And it really supported uh, my efforts as an educator. Thank you, Michelle. And our final stop, our last panelist is Adrian Carr, adjunct faculty member at the SUNY Plattsburgh. Adrian. Oh, 
and hi ah, yes okay there we go yeah um just another um zoom moment here um hey uh i i was very pleased you know to be able to take something like lumen circles because uh, as an adjunct we don't always get um the uh the chances to improve our teaching and uh, i did this because it was such a remarkable opportunity to um, kind of challenge myself and take a look at the things I was doing as a teacher and the things I wanted to improve on as a teacher. And that became uh, really the focus of my Lumen Circles experience. It's a nine-week course. It, um, it does take some time every week, but it's manageable. And you can think about it like taking a course about yourself, about your own teaching and about advancing your own teaching in the classroom. And um, the timing was particularly good for me because uh, it was during the pandemic when, you know, usually you have those chats around the um, drinking fountain or something like that, uh, or coffee or something like that with faculty members, but we didn't have that this semester. We didn't have that. And so uh, Lumen Circles was kind of a lifeline this semester for me uh, because during the pandemic, it was just fantastic to um, not only meet people in my own circles, but you have to understand, like Lumen Circles, you're, you're dealing in your circle. There's going to be faculty from all over the country. And I mean, I was, I was working with a, um, a person who taught, taught uh, periodontics and, and dental um, and, and was a professor at the uh, uh, University of Buffalo. And we were working together on a project and she stimulated me on, you know, something that I would have never thought of. So, so it was a great experience and it's free and it's a little bit of work and boy, I just, I couldn't recommend it enough. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks to all our panelists for their brief introduction. We're going to hear a lot more from our panelists in a few minutes, but before we get to that conversation, I want to turn it back over to Julie from Lumen, who's gonna give us a little bit of an interior tour of what it feels and looks like to be a participant in Lumen Circles. Julie. Thank you, Mike. Um, John, um, if you could let me share my screen. Thank you. All right, are you seeing a slide, everybody? Great. So, um, so first off, we'll be able to hear um, from the panelists more about the experience through their eyes. How we like to talk about the Lumen Circles experience is to start by talking about uh, a community and specifically a community of practice. So this is where you get a group of people together who are passionate or, or interest, have a, a common interest in, and in uh, growing and developing their skills in similar ways. And in this case, we're developing skills around teaching. And so as you come into a Lumen Circle, you're part of a community of practice focused on teaching. And as you come into this experience, there are really four key things that you're doing. So first off, you come in and you join a virtual community. One thing that's nice about it for busy professors is that it is, uh, it is virtual. So all of the required things are things that you can do um, pretty much on your own time frame. There is some synchronous uh, activity um, especially for folks that want that, um, the facilitator can help, uh, help make that happen. Um, but a lot of the activities that you're doing each week are something that you do um, on the time where uh, that makes sense for your schedule. But you are able to connect with peers virtually. And as you go through the process, you go through a set of activities that give you opportunities to explore evidence-based teaching practices in the context of the, the area of focus of your circle. So your circle might be a group of people who are focused on active learning or on online teaching or teaching with OER and OER enabled pedagogy. Um, it could be a group that's using Lumen uh, Waymaker courseware or own courseware. And so they're coming together uh, to develop their practices in those areas. So these are all different circle themes that we offer. You're with a group that wants to grow in that same direction that you're interested in growing. And at the heart of what you're doing is each week you're, you're doing reflections. You're thinking deeply about the kinds of teaching activities that you're doing and you're examining them and being thoughtful about the types of practices of, of 
teaching strategies that you're using, you're able to ask for feedback from your peers. Uh, you can ask for suggestions and, and um, ideas if there's something that you'd like some specific feedback on, you'd like to workshop. Um, and then uh, periodically you can step back and, and say, what is the impact that I'm seeing on my teaching? What's the impact on my students? Um, as I mentioned, we have several different uh, circle uh, areas of focus. And so you choose one and go through um, what's essentially a, a typically a nine week program. Um, and you go through this process with the same group of people. Um, we have people from a mix of different circles uh, here on the panel. So you'll hear some different perspectives in terms of the areas that they were able to explore. One thing that I will note, um, we recently added a new category of practices, um, and you'll see this category called belonging here. Um, we had some grant funding from the Gates Foundation to expand this evidence-based teaching framework. So here you see the, the four areas, supportive, challenging, varied, and organized, that have been part of this experience all along. And just this month, we are uh, completing a project to bring a new set of, of evidence-based practices that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so circles going forward from here will have the opportunity to explore that dimension as well, and also learn about teaching strategies, ways that you can incorporate those things into your, into your classes. The other thing I'll note as you go through this is the purpose of this, it's not like a bingo game where over the course of this window, you're supposed to do everything once in your classes. It's much more exploratory than that and more organic where you have an opportunity to become more thoughtful about the things you're doing already and build on those strengths and identify areas that you wanna encourage or push yourself and grow. Um, and so that's part of what a facilitator will do with you is to help coach you in the areas that you want to grow. Nicole has been both a fellow and a facilitator. So I think we can hear from her also about that uh, facilitator role and, and how, um, how, how that helps you guide uh, each of the fellows as they're developing their practice. The other thing that I want to do is just show you um, it is a, as I said, an asynchronous online experience. And so um, I wanted to show you where it actually happens. So this is the Lumen Circles platform. It's essentially a website that's designed to support faculty professional development. So when you come into a circle, you'll come in and each week of that circle, it will bring you right to the week uh, where the circle activities are happening. So this happens to be a circle that is focused on online teaching. And when you come in, uh, you'll see your circle members here on the left hand side. The one with the purple marker is your facilitator. So they're your, your coach and your guide through the process. Um, but you, all have, you also have opportunities each week to interact and share ideas with other members of your circle. Each week, there's a set of learning outcomes. So things that, that the activities will help you accomplish that, that week. Um, a set of activities, these might be readings or videos or examples that you can browse. Um, it might be an interactive activity uh, for you to do to explore and kind of build your understanding of a, a particular dimension of evidence-based teaching. And then there are some assessments. So there's some actual things that you do. Um, and so there's a reflection and then there's also an opportunity to collaborate or provide feedback. Each week you're assigned one reflection to share your own ideas and put those out there for the community. And then also you're assigned to provide feedback to read the reflections of two of your circle mates and, and provide some thoughtful feedback to them. Um, I'm just gonna click into a reflection so you can see uh, what it looks like if you were to do this. It's in a kind of a form format that tells you, here's what we want you to think about. Here's what we want you to to uh, kind of focus on this week. Um, and um, one other thing that I'll note is there is kind of a, a cycle in Lumen Circles where we ask you, one week we'll ask you to do some planning. So you'll be exploring some new directions. And we ask you to think about what is it you want to apply? What would you plan for to try in your classes over the coming week? And then the week after that, we ask you to step back and say, okay, here's what happened. So to come back around and share with your circle, uh, what happened when you put that plan into action and what worked? What did you learn through that process? 
and in getting feedback about both the planning and also the implementing the doing as you're trying out practices, it can be a really rich experience um, to, uh, to help you kind of push your own boundaries and try new things and get lots of great ideas and support from the community as you're doing that. So I'm going to now go back to the slides. Um, I, uh, we asked each of, the, each of the panelists to share for a moment um, one of the reflections and just talk about some of the work that they did during that process. And so um, actually, John, why don't I hand things back to you? Uh, let me stop sharing. Let's see, I'm having a hard time finding my Zoom controls, of course. They are elusive. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I will share screen myself now. And there we are. Do you see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. So Nicole, why don't you lead us off? Sure, thank you. Um, we take a look at reflective teaching. We take a look at um, Lumen's model with the appreciative inquiry. I think it's really important that we're not recreating the wheel and it already exists. We're not recreating what it is that we teach. We take a look at what we have and how we want to build on that. So when I went through this process, I took a look at the courses I normally teach. I took a look at just select lessons each week. And you can either do this, you know, from one course or in my case, I just jumped around and what I thought would be something I wanted to work on just for that week out of my courses and built on it. How did I want to reflect? What did I want to really take a deeper dive and understand how and why I taught that particular topic and how I can apply appreciative inquiry, how I could take evidence-based practices and look at what it is that I'm teaching, why I want to restructure something or how I want to build it out further for my students, um, taking a look at each of those different tags and seeing how it applies to what I normally teach and I happen to be in a circle for OER and open pedagogy. So being able to take that idea and take the lesson I'm already using, build on it, create more opportunities for my students, have my students work on those different assignments or activities or incorporating different resources into my course. And then the following week, follow up and see how did it work? You know, Is there something I should be concerned about? Is there something I should be looking at? Is there something I'm forgetting that maybe somebody else can take a look at my course or my lesson for the week and how they can build on it. And I think we all get to a point in our career where, you know, you just want to dabble in somebody else's course. You know, if I was teaching this, what would I do? Well, that's exactly what you get to do. You get to look at what someone's doing, comment on it in a very supportive way. When someone is stuck on something, you get to turn around and say, maybe this might work or oh, I never thought of that, how it is that I can help you. And then again, taking those evidence-based teaching practices and those tags and what you want to learn. I know for myself, I will always go for something technology related, but you also want to make sure that you're taking a look at what you don't normally use, something that you may not have thought of, something that can really round out your teaching. And being able to share that out every week is such a rewarding experience, being able to get feedback from one another and just taking a look at what you've written in your actual reflection, taking that deeper dive of I didn't realize that I'm actually doing that, or I didn't realize that this is what's really coming out of my teaching. Um, changing gears, I also facilitate. So being able to take that model and apply it to when I facilitate has been an interesting opportunity because I get to take a look at the exact same thing. Now I'm looking at it from a different lens. When I give you feedback as circle member, I'm looking to see what it is that I can provide help with. I've been through this before. I know some of the pitfalls, but more importantly, I know what I could maybe help you out with. I wanna see what it is that you're doing and what it is that I can support you to keep building out your lessons. And again, it could either be for one course or it could be just in general, how you wanna bring whatever that theme happens to be for your circle, just to the next level. Thanks, Nicole. Should we go on to Michelle? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, this initiative has really allowed me to experiment with different exercises in the classroom this past year virtually and possibly, you know, in the future, we might be teaching hybrid or in person and so forth. So I think it, you know, it allowed me to kind of analyze those student learning outcomes and taking it, you know, each week to sit down and to do a little self assessment and prepare for the following considerations and practice. So it was a continuous 
a reflective cycle week after week. And you were able to sit back and, and reflect on those little achievements you were making in the classroom, or just kind of sit back and say, is there a refinement uh, areas to refine uh, in regards to, you know, teaching and learning and the feedback from the students and what you were seeing. So it, it was a, a wonderful experience uh, in regards to just learning about, you know, your own style of teaching and saying to yourself, you know, is this truly working? And then making those adjustments accordingly a week after week. And this has been a wonderful experience by being able to do that. Thank you. And Jesus. Yeah, so uh, this, uh, this semester I wanted, I wanted to try something new and uh, I always teach about um, search tools if they are neutral. And uh, this year I wanted to do something different. Like I used to do it more like a lecture-like and I wanted to do something more in st uh, structured and more interactive. Um, this topic can be very dry so I wanted to make it in a way that actually they could feel like the students could feel a connection. So I found uh, this video, uh, it's changed the subject about this group of undergraduate students that actually see in the catalog that the term uh, illegal alien is still part of cataloging and they actually fight against it uh, and they go actually to, to DC. Uh, so, um, what we did is that students uh, look at the video, respond to some questions, and they could use uh, audio, video using VoiceThread. And that was great because, I mean, uh, different students, I mean, like different styles to, um, to practice conveying information and presenting information. And that really, really worked well. And they felt the connection with the undergraduate students going through the fight of eliminating the subject heading uh, illegal alien. Um, so, I mean, here, I mean, you can see uh, the learning plan that I have, the objectives. We have a, a discussion uh, the full following week. And uh, one thing that I noticed is that I, uh, students, some students have problems with voice thread. Some of you might know that. And actually, um, in the comments, some of my colleagues in the circle were, uh, gave me tips about how I could actually make sure that uh, next time students will know how to use VoiceThread without a problem. And one of the suggestions was just try like um, maybe in the beginning of the course, some exercises, uh, low stakes exercises where students get to use to the technology. So anyway, I got very big, good feedback from, from my colleagues. So um, failing, it's fine. I mean, you're learning new things and uh, it's a good experience. You, you don't feel lonely. And I think that's important. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And Adrian. Um, well, you know, I want to hit on a point that Jesus was talking about, about the people in the circle that you're working with. I mean, it's really fantastic because, as I kind of mentioned before, you're bouncing ideas off professionals who are in faced with the same challenges that you're faced with. And it's really a great experience. And also, the role of the facilitator in these circles. I mean, the facilitator I had, Lisa, was like amazing. She would do videos for us, personal videos for us each week and talk to us and, you know, challenge us and kind of point out, you know, at the beginning I had some uh, areas where I, I needed to be a little clearer. And uh, it was like, uh, it was a fantastic experience. And Lisa did it in such a nice way because we follow this pattern of appreciative inquiry. And we're able to help each other uh, get to the next step on the ladder. And I, I, you know, I mean, I could go through the individual things here in my, um, in my um, reflection, but I think it's more important to just understand what a fantastic framework this is for, um, for uh, just uh, working on yourself, your teaching practices, and getting yourself to the next level. Um, I, I think, and that's what I talk about in my reflection when I talk about uh, facing my demons. Uh, you know, the things that you don't want to change and you just want to get through the semester using the same format, using the same um, um, uh, um, 
syllabus and and you don't really want to change too much because that's more work but actually it's in the work that you really get something for yourself out of it yeah so I hope that resonates thanks Adrian um, and Julie if I could just jump in we did have one yeah, hand raised do. from our one of our and, attendees so. and I so it, I would love at this point we don't really need the slides I think we can get away right now it's just the open conversation so if we want to let it be people instead of slides let's uh, let's have the question start yes I know we have one hand raised feel free to uh, turn on your microphone um, or use the chat to ask your question so I will unmute you Please use the chat for questions. And Okay, so the question is coming through the chat and I'll read it. Uh, my question is the logistical one. Would the videos provided be accessible, for example, would they have closed captions? So that's a good question. Um, and we have, so the, uh, so yeah, that's that's one question um, and, and Naftali uh, will get your question as well. Um, so one question came in from Melissa Adam Silva about will captions be accessible? Um, the uh, videos that we use in the curriculum all have captioning. Um, there is a video record tool that's built into the platform and, and actually in the dialogue that I've had with you, Melissa, this week, um, highlighting that right now our in-tool um, uh, video recording tool doesn't have captioning, but we do have fel uh, both facilitators and fellows who have used um, an outside tool like Screencast-O-Matic that has a captioning capability um, and have used that um, in order to provide that. Um, and so that's definitely something that when there are accessibility needs, we want to surface those early so that we can look at what are the ways that we make those accommodations and ensure that that's a great experience for the fellows who are coming in. Um, so uh, that, that's an answer of yes, we are committed to, to finding ways to make, that, um, to make that work. So we have a lot of questions coming in the, in the chat. I'm gonna to try to do these in order. Uh, Topley, the logistical question, um, if you wanna use your microphone for that or put it in the chat. I see in the chat. Now, how does participation in the Lumen Circles align with our teaching? Is it anticipatory or concurrent? In other words, how open or closed should I make my syllabus? Open that up to the panelists, including yourself, Chris, who have participated. I, I think if I understand your question correctly, it's concurrent with your teaching, right? So you're not designing a course you're actually reflect and again this is what I was saying earlier about it being instrumental that you know so I know we get a lot of folks who say well I'm on sabbatical um I, mean, I have time to do something like this and um we recommend that you actually don't do it when you have a sabbatical or you have like a time off it's really meant to be in the moment because the, the questions that you're reflecting on uh, are like this week in class what you know something like this reflect on this so I think also you have a period where um, each week you're looking to prepare a lesson. So what, did it, what am I doing next week? How can I take a look at what I'm doing next week, discuss it, and build in some of that evidence-based teaching practices into the following week's lesson, or it might be a lesson somewhere down the road. And then the following week to go back and say, okay, this worked, this is that I took a deeper dive, this is what I learned from it, and this is what I want to keep building on and improving for each semester. Right. And then one of the cool things, there's an idea drawer that you have in this platform. So if you have a good idea, you put it in there at the end of your participation cycle, your term, you look at it and say, okay, and then you would use that to maybe when you go to do the syllabus for the next time you teach the course. I found that I was actually changing my lesson plan to facilitate ideas I wanted to try out from the Lumens, what I was learning in Lumen Circles too. I mean, the, I didn't design a, a course to, so I could take Lumen Circles, but 
you know, it was great to actually just change things up a little bit and try an idea out and see how it worked and then report back to the circle. I found that was, you know, kind of interactive in that way, kind of nice. And Adrian, I, I would say too is um, I teach uh, from a module standpoint, so I was using scaffold folding to set up my uh, semester mm -hmm. rather than a week to week. So this really allowed for a little bit of flexibility to be able mm -hmm. to test out those things. Uh, and you just wanted to try uh, just because, yeah. uh, and it really, it really made you know perfect sense for me to be able to do that uh, using that style. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I'm glad you did the same thing I did. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to get a little variety here. Um, there's one from Hope Wendell to our panelists. Um, so about the badges, are they important to, to you or is it more important the experience about the fellowship of learning from your other uh, faculty in, in, in the circles? I think it's more about the fellowship and what you learn. The badges are great, but it's really what you take away from it. You know, you're, you're doing a deeper dive into your own teaching. You're learning about yourself, learning about not just what you teach, but how you teach, why you teach, how it's benefiting your students. You're able to take that to the next level and say, okay, so now I've built this and I want to keep building. What do I want to build from this? What do I want to keep doing each semester, each year, into the future? You know, this spreads out over every single one of your courses. Even if you're just looking at one slice of a course during your nine-week fellowship, you will bring this back to all of your courses. And I would say rather quickly, <laughs> it, it will just start spreading to all of your courses, how you want to think about things, how you want to start redesigning stuff, You're very energized. That's the takeaway. What did people give you suggestions on? What did you build into your idea for? What did you start thinking on? What is it? And you, I know after my first term, I sat down and I said, you know, wow, I just got to download my brain and I want to start doing this immediately for the spring semester. And then that summer, what did I want to work on for the following year? You just keep building on it. And it's just, it, it's not overwhelming because it just becomes so intuitive because you're taking a look at what you already have and what it is that you want to create on a much better level. open that up a little bit wider to the rest of the panelists and just talk about um, how and if you engage students, what the impact was was on students uh, during your participation in Lumen Circle. So did you inform them that this was happening? Did you mention the changes that you're making to your teaching or lesson plans? Um, if you could dig in a little bit to that, that dialogue or maybe non-dialogue that you had with students about the experience. Adrian, you're muted. Sound like Sorry. Yes, I didn't tell my students that I was uh, doing anything, but um, I will say my course opinion surveys at the end of the semester were off the charts. So, I mean, it, I was able to be effective in what I was learning, but I did not uh, share with my students uh, that I was, that they were getting, I told them that they were getting uh, oftentimes uh, the benefit of we were trying something new, but I think it was a surprise. So I think one of the things that I seen the most was the engagement, especially for uh, the online teaching environment. Uh, and you would see the students log in, they, you know, every single class, rather than having to worry about your students, were they going to attend the next class, uh, especially, you know, with Zoom burnout being a, <laughs> a little bit of a concern. Um, but you would see them being enjoy, you know, taking enjoyment away from that and building a, a collaborative environment. So they felt like they had a place to go to. And you would find that the exercises I was implementing actually helped create a lot more uh, than just good assessment uh, or better learning outcomes. You were seeing an extension uh, of the benefits for the students. Great, thank you. 
there's a thread going on in the chat that I'm going to bring to light a little bit here. It's about recognition um, from your own campus for participation in Lumen Circles as a pro professional or faculty development um, activity. Uh, myself and Chris, obviously, we can't speak for the various practices that are in place across every SUNY campus in terms of how uh, development is recognized and or rewarded. Uh, what we can say is that, you know, if you choose to uh, participate in Lumen Circles and, and see it through to the end, there is a certificate acknowledging your efforts. Um, Lumen Circles is a, you know, a partner um, offered from SUNY Center for Professional Development and SUNY OER Services. So it's not, you know, something you kind of went out and found on the street. Um, that said, I can see some of our panelists are talking about the ways that they have included participation in their, in their, um, annual uh, uh, activity activity reports and or tenure and promotion uh, profiles. Great question, Julie. Julie's asked if the panelists could speak uh, approximately how long it took you to participate each week in Lumen Circles. Yeah, normally it's like two, three hours per week, I would say. But then it also depends on what you're teaching or if you want to make more changes or less changes. So, but at least I would say two or three hours. I would agree with that. You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah it, it, you know, you got to write the reflection and, and you want to do a good job. You know, you don't, you don't just, you know, um, so it, it, the more you put into it, kind of the more you get out of it, but two yeah. or three hours. Yeah. And connected with that, I mean, it's good that we as professors, we become students for a few months. Uh, because then we are fragile as well and and we we feel like the students are feeling so we are professors and the students at the same time and i think that's great that's a great point yeah okay, i'm just going to scroll through the chat one more question so in the uh, questions that yeah. some of the attendees submitted um, in advance, there were a number of people asking, will this help me do things that can engage my students more deeply in learning, whether it's in an online modality or just finding better ways to engage students? That seemed to be a, a key theme. What would you say to that? I would say for the posing questions uh, that I would implement or the one minute reflections, um, it created those critical thinking skills um, on different areas. And you would see the students, you know, go through that self-assessment and go beyond and take considerations about their own learning. Am I doing what I need to do? So you would start having those larger conversations. And I do think that helped with in the overall engagement, but actual true learning. It wasn't regurgitation of terms. It was real learning that was actually happening. I would definitely say it engaged student, my students more because I would come up with, I think I came up with better assignments. So I was asking a better question. So of course, I think I got more engagement this semester. you're also getting suggestions from other people i mean yeah. you're looking to see what it is that you're teaching and how you want to start building on that but also what questions you have of your circle and what they can help you with or what ideas people suggested to you or what ideas you found sometimes you know you come up with something and it's like oh i found this but i just don't have time to implement it but i can talk about the next iteration or what do i want to plan for or how would i want to do it better or how i want to do it even um, differently and what your students took away from it. Sometimes we'll turn around and say, yes, the students learn, but I need to do this better or I need to do this more or the students came back with suggestions on, can we do this? And it's great because you can start building that out over a, a small period of time. You know, a lot of the um, things I'm, questions I'm seeing in the chat, um, do I need to do this or is this required or is that required? I see a lot of these kind of questions in the chat. And I would say that um, the thing about Lumen Circles is it's very flexible. What you do and how you create it and how you take it in and how you run with it is really up to you. Um, and so I think I just like to speak to all those questions in the um, in the chat about do I need to do this or do I need to do that? It's it's really not that not like that. You you can do what you want to, and you come up with creative ideas that you wouldn't thought uh, thought of otherwise because of 
you're working with other people, you're in a circle, and you're getting great ideas from other faculty members across state, across the country. I had, there was a faculty member in, in British Columbia that I was uh, back and forth with. So it's, it's kind of like that. I'm glad you brought that up, Adrian. I was going to say something to that effect. I mean, we often, um, we've gotten some feedback here and there from folks who, you know, were um, uh, a little, I, I don't know if confused is the right term, but they were expecting uh, like a, a reading list and, uh, you know, a, a basically a syllabus, like you would teach a course and it's not like that at all. And I often say that the curriculum of you know, yes, the backbone is the evidence-based teaching practices, and there are plenty of resources that you can access in the process of going through a circle, but really the curriculum is your teaching practice. <laughs> you are the curriculum itself. You are sort of uh, learning about, you know, yourself essentially in the process. And, and, and that way, you, and I always say to people, you'll get it out of it what you put into it. So if you only have an hour a week, that might be sufficient for your needs, uh, but you know maybe a little more than that would probably be better. And you could take a week off every term, so there's a break week. Like something comes up, I'm going to take off this week. Yeah, like I connected with that. Uh, there was one recurring topic in our circle, which is was which which was little changes make a big difference. So even if you don't have a lot of time, believe me, you have that time. Sometimes a little tweak in your lesson makes a big difference. And we were surprised because I mean, that's true. So it's not about mm, big changes necessarily. It's about kind of thinking about how you can make things better. And sometimes it can be just small change can make a big difference. From a facilitator standpoint, I've taken, I've had um, faculty that span from, you know, brand new to been teaching 20 plus years like myself, and they've come up with very intricate lessons. And I've said, you know, that's wonderful that you're posting all this, but maybe take a step back and then take a look at one portion of it and let's build on it. And they've taken a look at over three weeks, four weeks, maybe taking a look at each component that they can build on or a topic that they're going to use the same type of uh, methodology of teaching in different topics that they can start building on. Like Sue said, you know, little changes, big, big impact. So if you're teaching a math course, you're always going to be teaching a certain type of methodology for math. Well, maybe just start working on a small component. And if it's the same thing going on the next week, we'll work on the next component. But then what happened with your students and how did that help influence what you're doing this week, next week, and start preparing for the future? Yeah. I, or for example, like let's imagine you, you're going to teach a class online that you used to teach face-to-face. -face. So now you kind of start thinking, well, how could I do this online? Or maybe it makes no sense to do it online. Little things like that make a big difference. Plus you're constantly getting weekly best practices from educators that are either in your discipline or in your um, cohort of campuses, depending upon what you're looking at. You're getting feedback from your facilitator. We're all coming in from different levels and we all have a stake in the game. We're all trying to improve student learning. And we're all there to help encourage one another and support and keep building on it. And I would say too, just to kind of tap off on that is, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to participate in the fall with uh, more business focused individuals. So that was nice for the discipline. But then in the spring, I was in a mixture of uh, different educators and it was nice to be able to pull uh, from different disciplines, different perspectives and be able to capitalize uh, on those uh, practices and, and, and really see a good, uh, you know, area uh, of improvement. Okay, we're almost at, at time, our scheduled time. I do want to pull out of the chat something that Julie uh, just put in the chat for those who might not be monitoring that. Nearly all circle activity, regardless of which circle you might end up choosing to participate in, is asynchronous. There's a synchronous orientation, so a one-to-one -one session with your facilitator at the beginning, and the one or two optional happy hour type sessions for those participants, those circle members who want to connect synchronously um, to just give you an idea of kind of what you might be signing up for. Um, and speaking of signing up, I know it's been put in the chat a few times. I'm going to put it in the chat again is the direct link uh, for SUNY faculty to indicate interest in Lumen Circles for uh, this coming summer and fall. Uh, so that, that link is in the chat right now. And final words from you, Julie, I'll leave the last words to you. 
Thank you. Well, first off, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, the panelists and um, and to to be able to hear kind of the richness of the experience that's there. So we are excited about being able to extend this opportunity for SUNY faculty as we head into the new uh, the new academic year. We do have a few circles running over the summer, and then we will have a lot more running in the fall. Um, I think we posted, uh, thank you, Mike, for posting that once more, the application form. Um, I will save the chat. In fact, I should do that right now while I'm talking. Um, I know there's a few, uh, there's a few more uh, questions that we didn't get to. So I will uh, go through and look over that and we'll get some answers out to, um, to those who uh, if we didn't get to your question. We'll also be sending a follow up email to everybody who registered for the webinar. So we'll have the recording, we'll have a link to the slides. Um, and then a little bit more information that might be helpful. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah.